Well, there was another um, article that went out on social media yesterday on Twitter, the journalist Peter Oborn, who voted for Brexit. He wrote an article that was widely shared to explain why he has changed his mind on the subject. And he joins us now. Peter, good morning. Good morning. Um, have you completely changed your mind? Did you, on reflection, vote the wrong way in the referendum? Well, certainly I think that we Brexiteers have got to... I wrote this article, it's very difficult to write, have got to wake up to the fact that, and admit, I think, that we're absolutely honest, that a lot of the promises which were made by Brexiteers haven't come true. In fact, the opposite has happened. You know, the, the claim that uh, Britain would flourish economically once we left the EU, I think is demonstrably false. The economic model has fa the, the, uh, for outside the EU has failed. And uh, we're seeing this. Uh, it really hits me. At, and all of us are patriots. We love Britain. Uh, and, one, and one company after another leaving Britain, the big car firms leaving Britain. And um, the Brexiteers, our great hero, Sir James Dyson, the industrial genius. He was a Brexiteer. He said we could flourish outside Brexit. Well, he's he's gone off. Um, which is a huge personal wounding blow. So I think we have to admit uh, that the economic claims made by Brexiteers, and that's really serious, but we didn't have gone wrong, and that's really serious. It's people's jobs, people's livelihoods. Uh, and, uh, well, you gonna... say they've gone wrong. Have they actually been properly tested yet? Because we haven't actually left yet. Yeah, in so anticipation of leaving, we've had Honda, we had Nissan, Panasonic. You go on the huge list of companies which have announced that they're going overseas or they aren't putting it building plants they were going to build in Britain. It has been tested. Moreover, the, um, the, the, the Brexit model, the WTO terms, World Trade Organization terms, that's terribly threatened by the rise of, of two strong men leaders in, in China and in the United States uh, moving towards a protectionist war. So the WTO, which the uh, Brexiteers relied on, we Brexiteers relied on, doesn't really work for us anymore in the way it did before Trump and Xi emerged as strong men in the United States. And yet you can point to other economic indicators which would suggest that the economy is much more resilient than many people had predicted. And this even in amongst the uncertainty which we are told business hates. So we're seeing employment at record levels. Um, just this year in January, GDP showing yeah. its biggest monthly rise in two years. Yeah, I'd remind you, absolutely. Study. If I could just finish, hang on a sec. Yeah. Mark Carney revising his predictions for a no-deal Brexit, saying he doesn't think it's going to be as bad or would be as bad as expected. European investors doubling their spending in the UK economy in the last three years. So, you know, there are other ways of looking at this. I'd remind you, I mean, they are, they are good statistics, but I really would make you think about this, that the uh, record un unemployment have been secured within the European Union. We haven't left it. Um, and we are seeing massive indications of a collapse in foreign investment and, and investment-led growth in this country. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the first thing I would say is, is just as a Brexiteer, I had to wake up to that. Uh, the second thing is the uh, the United Kingdom. I love Britain. Uh, I'm British, and I think it's I think we work really well together. But the the way in which the Brexit argument and the casualness with which the Brexiteers, I think, some of them are ready to t take the the union. We see the very very looming possibility. It shocked the Prime Minister, I know, when she went to Northern Ireland and suddenly realised that Northern Ireland made it choose to leave. Uh, and Scotland may choose to leave. We're, we, we're playing with something. Look, Britain is a wonderful country. We have a fabulous inheritance. We are a great, tolerant people. And there's something very acrimonious and awful in a way about... And I take my full share of responsibility for that, by so, the way. So you fear the breakup of the union as a consequence of Brexit. Can, can I ask you then, was it... The whole Leave campaign, in your view, if we follow your argument here, was it then a failure to see the challenges and complexities of achieving the kind of Brexit that they had envisaged? Or is it the intransigence of the EU to come up with a workable solution to these problems that is actually the source of the difficulty here? That that there is, there is a beneficial, positive Brexit that's out there achievable, but just not up against the, the kind of might of the EU27 that we're dealing with at the moment? I am... Um 
Look, I, 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 I was a, a Brexiteer. I think we gravely uh, failed to understand. I think I might be saying the Attorney General Geoffrey Cox said this over the weekend, the complexity of Brexit. It was, and there's no question that the leading Brexiteers, Liam Fox, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, made a whole series, David Davis, they have made a whole series of claims about how easy Brexit would be, the easier, big easiest trade deal in history, I think Liam Fox called it. We were told that there would be 40 trade deals up and running for when we left, which is, by the way, in four days' time, unless we do something about it. And that has simply hasn't happened. It's turned to be very, very complicated. Uh, and, and it's now become very dangerous because if it's going to impact, I'd say this to people's jobs. I would say this to my fellow Brexiteers, we're going to get an awful lot of blame if this goes wrong. It's people believe these claims that it's going to be the easiest trade deal in history. We're nowhere near it. It's acrimonious. There's a war in the Conservative Party So what party is the solution it. to all of this? And well, would you say revoke Article 50 altogether? I'd say at the moment that... Actually, to go back to your earlier question, I felt that Europe has been very fair-minded. I thought that President Tusk's offer of a year, I think we should, uh, a year's pause, we want a sabbatical, I think. I think. You want a sabbatical, by the way. We all want a sabbatical from Brexit, the whole world, of, uh, in order to think again. And the Prime Minister has sort of is, is a, turned into a shapeshifter. Uh, four days before we're meant to crash out of the European Union, we're going new plans and discussing new ideas. Look, let's just take a break. It's a massively important thing. It's the most important thing, uh, decision probably made by any British government for, um, you know, since World War II. We don't want to rush into it over the next four days. Let's just take a breather, go on a sabbatical, and just, re and now that we've learned so much about Brexit and what it'll be like. Okay. We've learnt an enormous amount over the last two and a half years. Absorb those lessons and think about it. I'm sure you've given many people food for thought. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Oborn, uh, the journalist there, who says it's now time to take a break on Brexit, on Brexit, a form of sabbatical to think again, um, having um, voted himself for leave. What do you think about all of that? Time to take a break? 85058 at BBC Five Live. It's 7.50.